I'm here in Medjugorje. I'm with, what's your name? I'm Kales. Where are you from? I'm from Leash in Ireland. And when did you hear for the first time about Medjugorje? What did you think when you heard about the story? My first time in Medjugorje. I, this is my fourth time here. But I, when I first came here, I was 13 and it was back a couple of years ago. And I actually didn't want to come. I cried the night before. I did not want to come. <laughs> came with your parents? Or? Yeah, my dad brought me out. I did not want to come. And then I came here and the first day, like, you know, it, it was okay. The second day, a little bit better. And then it got better and better as the days went on. And then I actually understood why people came. You know, the prayer and the rosary. I, I got my first proper rosary that felt like it did something. And, you know, like that was, it was the first time was quiet. And then the second time I came back again and I was much happier to be back. And I had so many little, well, not little, they're not little at all, big encounters with Jesus. I remember the day we climbed Cross Mountain. I was kind of like, I don't want to climb this mountain. I didn't want to really go. And then we got to, I'm going to say this 12th station of the cross. I knew that I was going to cry. I didn't know why. I didn't want to. I swallowed my tears, went to the next one, and then it just crossed it out. It had to happen. And then I got to the top. I had a good old cry for a while, and then we went back down. But I didn't know why I was crying. I wasn't sad. I wasn't overcome with anything. It, it, I just, when I started to come back down, I felt so relieved because I think I subconsciously had some things I needed to just leave there and come down without but I just hadn't realized it and then at once they were gone they were gone and then I was back down at the end of the mountain happy out wow. yeah amazing mm -hmm. and did you doubt ever about your Catholic faith or? well sort of like I got into my faith properly when I was about 12 it was before I got my confirmation with school and I owe a lot of this to my dad he would pray with me every weekend and you know like we'd say rosaries together and he taught me most of what I know and then the more we prayed, the more I understood. Again, Friday night we used to go to Mass and then we'd have the Rosary afterwards. And again, I didn't want to go. At the beginning, I didn't want to go, but I didn't argue. And then the more we went, the more it made sense. And then I'd actually get nearly upset if we didn't go. Like I wanted to go badly. I'd get upset if we didn't go. And then that's when Medjugorje came in and that solidified a lot of things. Like it solidified our Lady for sure, because I heard, oh, you know, Our Lady appears, but I was like, mm, are you sure? Like, really? Like, I don't know about that. And I'd heard of a couple of places where this had happened, like Medjugorje, Lourdes, Basin, Magar, Bandal, and a, a lot of things, but I didn't buy it. I didn't. Until you go, you won't understand. <laughs> yeah, explain, yeah. you went to Lourdes as well, you said. No? I did, yeah. Lourdes was a part of a thing I did with school and one of a teacher I knew he worked in the school beside mine and there was three st uh, students from my school and three sco students from the other school and the six of us were picked to volunteer to push wheelchairs out in Lourdes and you know it's actually funny because this happened before Covid and I was praying he said to me you know like if you want to come you know I can probably bring you and I said yeah absolutely that'll be great and then a couple of things came up and he said, I'm really sorry, but I, I can't bring you anymore. The spaces are full. It's not going to suit, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't going to happen. I wasn't taking no for an answer. And for whatever reason, I really had to go. I felt like I never really felt called from Medjugorje properly, but I understood it once I got there. But Lords, I had to go. And so I prayed and I prayed and I prayed until I felt peaceful about it. And I felt, you know, if I'm going to go, now that's Our Lady and that's it and if she doesn't want me to go I'm okay with it like I'm at peace now I'm happy with whatever the answer is mm -hmm. then I remember one day I got home from school and I didn't have a great day like it just wasn't good and my mum came in and said that she'd been speaking to that teacher and he said he wanted me to go to Lourdes this is a couple of weeks later and I actually I didn't know what to do. I was so happy. <laughs> I was so happy I got to go. It was the best thing that I think, genuinely, I think it's the best thing that ever happened. Yeah. And Why? Because when I went out there, I had been praying a couple of small prayers. It wasn't anything huge, but, you know, I prayed to Jesus and I said, I know you want me here. I know Our Lady wants me here. There's no question about that. But, you know, it'd be really nice if you just showed me one thing that I meant to volunteer. 
and I'm meant to do things for other people. And then that was fine, you know, went on about my day, you know, it was great. And, you know, you probably know in Lourdes, there's hospitals everywhere and all these chapels, like there's chapels in the hospitals. And I pushed my lady Anne, we were going into the hospital chapel, going up the lift. And like that time I went up Cross Mountain, I felt something unusual. And I had a feeling that, you know, I was going to cry. And then we got into the chapel and then Jesus was sitting there on the altar. The windows were open. There was a choir singing and it was the most insane encounter I think I've ever had, ever. And I remember just sitting in the pew and everything was going on around me and everything was okay. And it was just the weirdest thing because, you know, I always know, you know, it'll work out, but I never felt like everything would actually be that okay and everything was as it's supposed to be in that moment ever before and I haven't got anything like it since but I remember it so clearly like it was yesterday that if I ever if I ever need to you know get encouragement or something or if I'm ever in mass and I'm kind of daydreaming I have to remember that the Jesus I'm with now is that same Jesus that was in that chapel in Lourdes and you know there's I, there's, it's, it's all going to be okay like, like that time when I was in the chapel you know I knew it was all going to be okay and nothing has changed yeah so there was that deep feeling of security yeah and you women look for the security you know, yeah like a, yeah and he gave it to you yeah wow amazing it's crazy <laughs> yeah. and what what would you tell now you know I mean you're going to school or to university I'm now. in university yeah and I mean you see the young people if you all Tell the time. them this stuff. They they go like, man, you're you're weird. I know. Yeah, it's crazy. Some and of my own friends think yeah. that I'm kind of crazy. But you know, when you experience this for yourself, like you will know that you are not crazy, and you will nearly you'll nearly pity them for not understanding, yeah. because it is hard. It's very difficult. And if anyone tells you otherwise, they're not telling you the truth. But like I said, once you know, like you know, and. In the beginning, it doesn't take a lot to kind of get in there with Jesus. Like you just, a couple small prayers every now and again, and then you'll see yourself change. You'll see the things you want to change. You'll see your heart posture change. You won't want the things that you previously wanted. And that's why, you know, when people say like, if you pray for something and you don't get it, that no is another door opens and you'll be so glad that you didn't get it. Yes. Because yeah, and then you'll see like how much that would have been actually awful for you if you got it. And you see, Jesus knows these things. Our Lady knows these things and they know what to give you. You are made in the image of God and you are made to be like Jesus. And that's your, that should be your goal, to be like Jesus. What well, does, does that make concrete in your life? Yeah. How, how, should, how should we be then? Sorry? How should we be then? You, you how should, should you be that? Yeah? Well, prayer is the first thing. Like, I don't know, but I can't do that if I don't have the grace. Yeah. And the only way to get the grace is through Jesus. And Our Lady especially, like Our Lady has done very special things. And you know, and I heard a friend actually speak to me today about this statue of sleeping St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. And she writes down her prayers and she puts it under the statue and it's achieved. That's something I want to get into because they, they, they swear by it. Like they say that it works 100%. And so, you know, I feel like that it's, it's another thing that if you're worrying, it'd take your mind off it because it's sorted. And if you want graces for things, you know that sacraments are great. Like, you know, that's the whole purpose of the sacraments and the sacramentals. So, you know, going to confessions, receiving the Eucharist, and then, I don't know, saying a rosary to Our Lady. And another thing people forget is you don't have to sit there and do nothing to pray. Like, you know, we're told to pray without seas. So if you're doing something, you're potting around the kitchen, pray that way. Because I find that helps me as well, because I don't know, I'm. It helps me focus on what I'm trying to say, and it just it does a lot. It works wonders, really. Mm. Wow! And you you made the experience that just praying from the heart yeah. is enough. We don't have to perform. <laughs> we don't have to one million rosaries a day. No, no. no. A simple prayer from the heart, authentic, honest. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not perfect either. I, I sometimes I don't even pray every day. Yeah. But then once you get back into it, you know you'll be okay. You will be okay. Yeah. And what would you tell people? What is so special about Medjugorje? What is Medjugorje for you? I think everybody has a similar opinion that when you come into Medjugorje, you feel peaceful. 
and you don't get that at home and partially because you know you're away from home and you're not surrounded by work and like your family troubles or whatever's going on but it's different to going on just a regular trip abroad because our lady is here and there's confessions everywhere there's mass on all the time there's adoration there's everything that you could possibly need to keep you to keep you in line with what you should be doing with yourself and for god and peace is just everywhere and everybody is calm everybody seems happy and you know it's it's like this you hear so many stories from other people about what happened to them and what jesus did for them and how bad their life was and then jesus took it all from them and sorted it out like when you hear all this the encouragement you get from that is so so good and a lot of things i hear i hear this a lot as well whereas people said oh you know i don't want to go to medjugorje i don't really want to go and it's they, they refuse the offer to go and then if once they went their whole life had been changed and it's just amazing it's just amazing and it makes you really wish that you know like more people who knew to pray for them to get the chance to go but to also say yes to that chance because a lot of people don't want to and if they did you'd be very surprised what could happen oh wow, amazing and you talked about several central points confession for you as a woman what is confession for you is it hard to go to a priest to talk about all yeah the stuff or? yeah of course it's hard and it's like you have to think about it beforehand but you know you are going in there to talk to technically a stranger who you've never met which is kind of petrifying which should also be your comfort like you're abroad this priest is probably coming from abroad on a pilgrimage as well but is just kindly offered to do confessions if you say something to a priest you're speaking to jesus and then at the end of the day like you're never going to see the priest again more than likely you're probably never going to see the priest again so if you get your confessions you feel so much better after it that it outweighs any fear or anything you had before because like i know when you go in like some of the things you can say are very personal and very private and not something you'd even say out loud let alone to this random person but it's just important to remember that this priest is a vessel for jesus to speak to you and this priest is there to give you the benefits of the sacrament and th the priest can't judge you or do anything like that it that's not how it works and you, like i said you'll feel so so much better after mm. yeah And then we say in our Catholic faith, you're in a state of grace and you can go to receive Holy Communion. Yeah. What is Holy Communion for you? Holy the Communion, Eucharist. yeah. Holy Communion is just literally me being able to get Jesus literally into my soul and speak to Jesus that way. And it's kind of like, you know, if you ever try to pray and you're trying to speak to Jesus, but you don't have the words to actually say what you want to say. It's like, okay, Jesus, you're in my soul now. You've made my soul. You know exactly what's going on there. Just do what needs to be done. Please just do what needs to be done. And that way, like I have the comfort of knowing that Jesus understands me better than I understand myself because he made me. Like before I ever existed, he made me. <laughs> And so anything that goes on, he gets it. And you know, another thing to remember is Jesus was human too. And I think this is so comforting that Jesus walked this earth And Jesus had the emotions that we have. And Jesus was scared. Jesus got angry. Jesus was joyous. Jesus is love. And Jesus is understanding. So you have to remember that there's nothing that he doesn't get. And it's just, it's one of the nicest things about Catholicism, I think, that I love. You know, because no one else has this. No other faith has the Eucharist. And no one else has these unexplained Eucharistic miracles where it just starts to bleed. Nobody has that. And another thing I've heard, I, I don't have no witnesses now, but like there'd be people in St. James's Church in front of the Eucharist and they'd have unexplainable exorcisms. Just for no particular reason, there's no priest trying to do it, but it's just the Eucharist takes all of these demons out. So when you think about it, if you receive the sacraments, you're doing okay. You're really doing okay. Yeah. Wow, it's amazing what you're saying. It's just <laughs> and um, the rosary prayer for you. It's hard to pray the rosary. Sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes it can be. But the more you pray, the easier it gets. And again, I started praying when I was 12. I remember when I didn't own a rosary beads at the time. This was before I got my confirmation. And we have a picture of the Sacred Heart in the kitchen, and a rosary beads was hanging down. And I remember thinking that everyone at home would think I'd be weird if I was praying it. So when no one was in the kitchen. I used to run and steal the rosary beads and make sure no one was looking and run back into my room and pray. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I have this little blue book that my granddad gave me and it went through the sorrowful mysteries, the joyful, the glorious and the luminous. And it said, which day you were meant to pray each prayer. And I said, okay, I'm going to follow this little book. And it had even as far as the Hail Mary and the Our Father written out. And I remember in the beginning, I get distracted and I wouldn't know what I was really doing. But then the more I prayed, the more I felt myself like focus on the mysteries and focus on what I was meant to actually be praying about. And at the time, I didn't really have any intentions, but it was actually funny what happened because I remember like I'd pray for my mom, you know, just things going on and no particular reason again. I just, you know, you want to pray for your mom. And she said, I don't know, but I, I'm pretty sure I remember this very clearly. I was in school and she was in the car and she was talking to somebody and she goes, somebody must have been praying for me recently. I don't know what's going on, but there was loads of rabbits and hares on the front lawn and butterflies and loads of creatures. And they ran in and they were hopping around the back. And that's really weird because we don't see them ever. That's what she said. <laughs> so Our Lady does things in mysterious ways and you don't see it until you hear things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful prayer now, isn't it? Powerful. <laughs> Powerful prayer. That's saying, it does wonders. It yeah. does wonders. Um, Fasting, is that hard for you? Did you say fasting. the five stones, you have Wednesday oh, Friday yeah. fasting of bread and water? It is difficult, but I find it much easier here. Mm -hmm. And again, it's another thing like the rosary, the things that happen from when you fast are surreal. Yeah. Like bread and water, you know, like we're going to climb Apparition Hill tomorrow, I'm going to probably try and fast. And then if I think of one big intention that I have, or even several small ones, at the end of the day or when I go home, I know that it'll be okay. I know that Our Lady will have it. Yeah. Wow, amazing. It seems now, you know, a lot of people think God the Father is an angry old man with a white beard. Yeah. You experience a different God. Can you mm -hmm. explain? That's really not true. Like, I study theology. That's my degree. And we talk a lot about the nature of God. And you'd be surprised what you'd hear some people say in the lectures. They're like, oh, you know, he's this angry guy from the Old Testament. And, you know, he's just kind of sitting there telling us what to do and telling us on Fridays we can't turn on lights or rip toilet paper or do any of these kind of things. But that's so not true. Because if you think about it, God the Father is the one who wanted to create the world in the first place. He's the one who designed the human. And then when the fall happened, he's the one that decided we need a human version of himself to try and fix all this. And it's like, you know, like Jesus was his only son. And you can imagine that if you had children, you wouldn't want to send one of those off to be killed, even if it was for the greater good. But not only did God the Father send his only son, but Jesus willingly did it because he was 100% God and 100% man. And that's what people forget. So when you think about it, between the Holy Trinity, all it is is love. And I think that if people are reluctant to believe in God, like you have to think about it. Why would you deny someone who just wants to love you completely and wholly for who you are and not want to change you but not only do that but get you into heaven to be in eternal unity with God like there's no reason why you shouldn't want that so if anyone's ever doubting it I think think of that and priests as well like you know priests are always happy to help and you don't even have to go for confession but like you know they're great spiritual directors or even someone that you know who has been in the faith for a longer time than you have they're always really good to help and you know all of this will come to light in doing those things mm -hmm. and like I said with your heart posture that will change when you pray to Our Lady and then you will see all of the benefits and you won't want to have it any other way anymore. So beautiful you say you have like a spiritual guide? I don't but I'd like one <laughs> but I've heard people say that if when they do have them you know they find them very beneficial and you know when I do go on pilgrimage and stuff you know you'd speak to priests like even in a confession mm -hmm. and then you go on a rant and you'd explain everything to them and you get some really good advice back so I can imagine that seeing someone frequently to speak about you know your problems or whatever in a religious circumstance mm -hmm. would help a lot yeah and can you study theology can you explain you said it's the forgotten person in the Trinity is the Holy Spirit yeah how, how would you explain being guided by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. how to have a personal relationship with Christ through the Holy Spirit? Can you explain that, how it's for you? For me, the Holy Spirit is mainly the feeling of God mm -hmm. because I know God the Father doesn't either, but Jesus has like his human form mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit is forgotten because it's known as a dove. But, you know, 
like especially in Medjugorje, like you can see the Holy Spirit work through testimonies. But not only that, I think it's amazing when you see people get prayed with and they're fallen through the Holy Spirit and they walk up feeling God and they know. And it's things like that that make them so doubtless of the truth of everything. And it's things like that that solidify people. And that's what keeps people coming back, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 times in their life. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is so, so important. And I think, I don't want to rank them out of importance, but the Holy Spirit, even though it is forgotten, I feel like we wouldn't have the Trinity without the Holy Spirit. We wouldn't have so much without the Holy Spirit that we need to stop forgetting about it. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's simple because a nun once asked me, wow, it's a mystery, the Trinity. It's not a mystery, it's one in love. Mm -hmm. Simple, one God in three forms. In three forms. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah. Just, just a different form. Yeah. But that's it. The essence, love, and truth. Love. Yeah. And um, so Christ is for you now like a friend. Yeah. Like you talk to him like a friend. So yeah. This is my situation now. Yeah. It's funny because, you know, people think the prayer is only like, oh, you know, Hail Marys and Our Fathers. Whereas, you know, it does consist of that and they're very important. But when you start praying properly, you feel yourself start telling Jesus random things about your day as if you were literally on a phone to a friend because Jesus doesn't go away you know you don't have to ring Jesus and see if he's available he's readily available all the time so it's nearly like as if you talk to yourself in your head but you aim it at Jesus and it's you're telling Jesus oh this happened today and this happened oh whatever happened today oh, that's I'm actually upset over that that was so good and thank you for that you see that this happen in your head and it's just funny how, you know, the more you pray, even just like that, the more things that happen and the more good things that happen and the bad things are taken away. It's, yeah, it's special. It's really special. You also made the experience when you have a grateful heart that more, more yeah. graces come, more, yeah. more, more answer, prayers are answered. Yeah, because, you know, you have to recognize, like, even though you might want to take credit for all the things you've done, you owe all of it to Jesus. You do owe everything you have to God. And you did do great things, but it was only through Jesus that you did those things. So even if you're missing something big in your life or you want something really big to happen, you have to be grateful for everything that you do have. Because again, all of that came from Jesus. And I don't know, like, even if I think about it, if I was doing some good things for a friend and I'd done good things for them in the past, I would be a lot more reluctant to do things for them if they were very ungrateful for it. And like, you know, you still should do it anyway, but it's just nice to know that they're grateful for the things that you've done. Yeah. And I wouldn't think that Jesus is any different. Yeah. Like he is 100% love, but you know, it's nice to just recognize the good things that he has done for you. Yeah. And we tend to forget it so fast. We get the prayer mm -hmm. answered and next, next question yeah. already. Yeah. Maybe sometimes write down, I call it a miracle book or prayers answered. Yeah. But remember that it's a living God who is right there in every second of the life. Yeah. No? Did you make the experience when you pray or live in the intention, Thy will be done, that you're more, more in peace, more in joy? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. yeah, because it depends on, well, it doesn't really depend. It depends on like how much I pray about a certain thing. But I would pray and pray and pray about big things until the point where I feel like, not that I feel like I don't need to pray, but that thing has been taken into account by God. Like Our Lady has brought that to Jesus now and I don't need to worry about it anymore. So I will still pray, but just not maybe as much about that particular thing. And then, you know, you find that you won't worry about it anymore because Jesus has it and there's no reason for you to worry. And he wants you to know that he has it under control and that there's no need for you to worry about it anymore. So in return, he'll give you the grace of joy, the grace of peace. And you know, the fruits of the Holy Spirit as well. You can't forget about those. Yeah. Like if you pray for them, you will get them. Yeah. Yes. You, so you made the, also the experience that you have to ask specifically, yeah. very concrete, in detail. Yeah, yeah, I find that helps a lot. Because if you're kind of wishy-washy about it, it's like, you, you know, Jesus still wants to help. And of course, he knows your soul. He knows exactly what you want. He knows the desires of your heart. But sometimes, you know, you can't have a relationship with him if you don't speak to him. Yeah. And he wants to know, like he's sitting there waiting on us to speak to him all the time and he wants to know everything. So why shouldn't you put in details, you know? And he wants to help. And I feel like, you know, maybe it's just a me thing, but I feel like the more details I give him, the better he's able to help me. Yeah. yeah. Of course, it's written in the Bible. I don't want your offerings. I don't want sacrifices. I yeah. want your love. Mm -hmm. That's wants, it. 
the relationship. Yeah. That is, yeah. And um, you, you came now four times here. You always come back. Yeah. So is it still the same Medjugorje like it was at the beginning or did that change somehow? Well, it'll always be the same. Medjugorje is Medjugorje. I come here for peace mm -hmm. and I come here for friendship because I've met so many people here. Like it's funny how God works because there's two girls that I met the last time I was here and now I consider them some of them my closest friends and I'm in college with them and you know they were telling me, I remember me telling me about the Catholic Society and now I'm on the committee and you know Dean there as well like the two of us are on the committee and it's just crazy how things happen because I don't know like another thing I pray about is Jesus use me as my as your hands and feet and I love and, that prayer yes me and too. then and? you'd be surprised what happens I you know you see yourself happening like things happening like you are doing things for Jesus you're doing things to bring people to Jesus and it's kind of metaphorically like you are his hands and feet he's using you to do things for him and you know, if you let him do that. <laughs> you would see, it's an adventure, no? Yeah, it's like, so fun. It's, it's so, so fun. fun, so yeah. exciting, fulfilling. Yeah. All what we are looking for, young and old, a yeah. fulfilled life, no? Because people worry about having purpose and they're afraid, oh, you know, like, what's my purpose in life? And it's like, I don't know, if you go to Jesus, he made you, he will give you that purpose. He has that purpose for you. And if you look for it, you will find you will find it and then if you trust him surrender is another thing that people aren't very good at me too by the way i'm not very good at it either but once once you do it properly and you surrender your problems to jesus surrender your life to jesus you will see so much happen and everything will change and everything will turn out good and it doesn't mean that bad things won't happen because they really will they still will but you have jesus to rely on and he wants us to rely on him. We're supposed to rely on Jesus, not ourselves. Because if we rely solely on ourselves, that's just pride. And that's one of the seven deadly sins. We're not supposed to do that. So if you trust in Christ, and if you trust in our ladies, and you, are, and you pray, you're doing okay. You'll be fine. But to explain people deadly things, sins, what does it mean? You are spiritually dead. Mm -hmm. When you become humble, you surrender, you yeah. become alive, you become yeah. fullness. It's not meaning mm -hmm. like that you are judged and yeah. Just that you get into the fullness. Yeah. You, know? you are spiritually dead, with me, which means you don't have joy and you don't mm -hmm. have peace at the end. No? Yeah. You see, they scare people, and I mean, they kind of should. Like, you know, they're supposed to scare us so we get back into Jesus, and we're supposed to have a bit of a fear of God so we go back in with Him. And the seven deadly sins, you know, people think that if you commit one, you can never get into heaven, which is not true. You have to confess it, but it has to be. It has to be a confession where you're not doing it so you don't just go to hell. Yeah. You have to confess it so you can actually get back in union with Jesus. And so you will be in heaven, but you know, you have to do it because you genuinely feel guilty. You have to feel wrong. You can't do it just because you feel like you should. Or else, I think I'm right in saying that you're still in a state of mortal sin. Mm -hmm. But you know, and once you get out of mortal sin and you go to confessions, like I said earlier, you will feel so much Relieved better. And yeah, happy, like a deer jumping around. Yeah, on there you go. Everybody, yeah, no? and even regardless of whether your sin is mortal or venial, yes. you know, any confession for yeah. any sin will do you the good, so much good. And lady, I thought the Holy Spirit said, let's mention what are the seven deadly sins? You know them. You are, well, you? I think I can list them off. Oh, this will be embarrassing if I can't. Yeah. Well, we we'll try together. Not in we order. We give homework. Humble. Yeah. Pride. Mm -hmm. um, lust, wrath, gluttony, sloth, jealousy, envy. That's one too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know better. Uh, you study. Have I, I'm I forgotten learning. One? <laughs> Have I <laughs> Honestly, forgotten one? I don't know. There's a friend. Greed. Greed. Greed as well. You see, we, yes, have, we have a helper here. The Holy Spirit was speaking. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Through a friend. Yeah. <laughs> You're saved. Yeah, I'm safe. Yeah? <laughs> and um, yeah, think about it, you know. It's, mm -hmm. But it's it's just if we do these things, I see it in my life, I'm, I'm dead inside. Yeah. It's That's why it's a deadly sin. We are, yeah. we are, we are not full. We are not happy. Yeah. And the devil has somehow power of us because he makes out of a mice an elephant. Then. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, you know, it's guilt as well. Yeah. Because if you know you commit one of the deadly sins, you feel guilty over it. Yeah. And then you might be like, oh, you know, like there's no point in saying prayers anyway until I get a confession. But then you mightn't want to go to confession because you feel too guilty. Yeah. And it's just an That's endless the That's cycle. Yeah. 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 No, you hear it all the time about people yeah. and, you know, they're just stuck in this cycle and they don't know what to do about it. 
but then again confession is the answer to that and you know again you'll feel so much better after and, and in in between I, I tried it one time like I said with the fr with your friend pray the rosary mm -hmm. that will lift you a bit out of darkness yeah. already yeah and don't judge yourself Father Pio said get up again when you failed walk again upright go yeah. to confession keep on going don't go into despair yeah talk to a friend and then go to a priest That's and ask it. for a good confession no yeah and what would you tell people now why come to Medjugorje one time come to Medjugorje pray about it and you will find the perfect opp opportunity to come it'll all fall into place and Our Lady if Our Lady wants you there you will come and it's especially if you're only getting into the faith like you know you hear people all the time and they come to Medjugorje and they were only kind of lukewarm before and then they come and they experience the Holy Spirit they experience Jesus and Our Lady firsthand and then everything makes sense the peace the amount of prayer, the good confessions, and you know, there's priests that will be on your pilgrimage with you, and then you'll get to know them, and you'll hear them speak, and there's mass every day, two, three times every day, and you can hear loads of different talks, and there's something for everybody here, and Our Lady knows everybody who's here, and every time you get the opportunity to go, that is an invite from Our Lady. She wants you there, and she will make things work for you if you do come. Well, what can I say? Thank you. And I would like to add something listening to you, you know. There are now men, parents, fathers listening, you know. Mm -hmm. You have such a big role. Look at you. You talked about your father, mm -hmm. your grandfather. Yeah. That is the important for a girl. You yeah. can form her identity in Christ. We have such a big responsibility as men. We are so brainwashed and we have to get back to be just good men yeah. and, and talk about the faith, be in the faith. Mm -hmm. and give it like you I see a stable young woman here it's because of your it father. is because of that yeah it's because of that yeah it's difficult and I can imagine that it was difficult for him as well because I don't know like in the beginning I probably thought he was talking nonsense and I see you know other people talk about their families and they never believed you know like their parents or their grandparents whenever they said oh you know you should pray like you should do this sit down and pray the rosary with us or anything like that or you know do you want to come to mass and they say no so it's difficult and I, I like you know I give them a lot of credit for that yeah. because I can guarantee you I would not be in Medjugorje or anything without them and yeah. again don't if, if you are not we are nobody has no fault somebody listen now feeling maybe ashamed man i'm not a good father but you can change now start mm -hmm. the journey now yeah. it's never too late and don't be embarrassed go to a priest and you know it's 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 not to condemn you it's to inspire you these videos we do for inspiration to yeah. change to to you know yeah, yeah. it's but, all for the sake of hope you know nobody the, it's not for shame None of this is for shame. Yeah. And people go in feeling ashamed for the things that they've done, but the whole purpose is to get rid of that shame through yeah. prayer and through Jesus. That's the whole entire point, yeah. And you made maybe the, the experience as well. You left things on Cross Mountain. Yeah. All these things at the end, the problems, the challenge are gold nuggets just to get closer to God, yeah. to grow in faith, to get yeah. closer, to start talking to God like a friend. That's it. That's it? Yeah. What can we say? Hello from Medjugorje. For all <laughs> Hello from Medjugorje. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that beautiful interview. Thank you so interview. much. You're welcome. <laughs>